And so I have shortened it for us All right. and made it much easier. And so we're going to cover these four topics in this study. Body of Christ, family of God, one body, question mark, um, and then my role. And so this is what you teach so people understand what the church is biblically and what uh, it is not and also what our role is in the church. So uh, before we get started, I want to share my uh, two favorite scriptures about the church. Let's go to Matthew 16. This is the uh, first time that the word church is used in the whole Bible right here. In uh, verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. And so the word church was originated, uh, according to the experts, by Alexander the Great, and he's the one in the kingdom study that conquered the whole world, the whole known world. And so he gathered some people and called them his church and gave them the rules. And then the church went and told the whole world what the rules were under his leadership. And so Jesus says, I'm going to start my church. And so he gathers the church. That's us. We have his rules. And our role is the same, to go and tell the whole world what his rules are. Amen? Amen. And so here he says, that the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And that's my favorite part. Like, you know, gates, they secure things. And what is uh, Satan trying to secure? All the souls of mankind that are doomed to destruction and hell forever with him. And he's like, my church is going to kick down that gate. And we're going to go in there. We're going to steal all those souls and bring them into the light. Nice. And that gate's not going to stop us. So I love that. Look over at First Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy 3, here Paul is writing to his uh, young leader, and in verse 14, he tells him this. First Timothy 3, 14, he says, Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions, so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God the pillar and foundation of the truth, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. Now this next section here is uh, a song. They wrote this song concerning the church. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. This is the church. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. This is where we find the truth. And when the truth is broken, it no longer holds the spirit. The spirit cannot be where there is not absolute truth. Amen. And through the truth, we learn how we should conduct ourselves. That's awesome. Okay, let's get into the study. You ready? Yep. First point, body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, starting in verse 15, says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. So here it says that uh, the head is Jesus, and the body is the church. And I don't know about you, but uh, I like my body with a head. <laughs> my head with body. Amen? Amen. <laughs> the church is essential to Christianity. Uh, in this generation, uh, people use YouTube <coughs> as their church. <laughs> That's not biblical. YouTube Christianity is unbiblical. Yep. Uh, we need each other, mm. the body. Mm. In, the, uh, in the Bible, the, the church... It's called the way, it's called the kingdom, and it's called the body. And they all mean the same thing. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. That was the first point. That was easy, right? Yeah. All right. Second point, family of God, Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 19, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So here it says that we are members of God's household. We're being built together with total unity. And the foundation is the apostles and the prophets, which is the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's where we find that. And so we have household rules, right? Right? There's household rules, right? I know with uh, uh, Jill and I, with Jordan and, and Bella, as they were uh, growing up, we had two rules. Must be happy. And no fighting, and that was it. If uh, if some if one of them were was not happy, we'd go. Sorry, you can't hang out with us right now. You gotta go to your room. Oh, yeah. And and I remember one time we were having a, a fun art time, and Bella wasn't getting what she wanted, and she started getting sad. And Jill's like, "Sorry, you're not happy. You gotta go." And so she's like going up the stairs, and then she goes. <laughs> and Jill's like, all right, come on back. Came back out. I mean, it's so easy. It's so easy. You don't have to be down, downcast. You can be happy. You can make that decision. But for us in, in uh, the church, our rules are the Old Testament and the New Testament. Those are our rules. And I believe they are not a burden because that's what Jesus says. And then he says that Jesus is the cornerstone. Look over in Hebrews chapter 2. Jesus is the example. Okay, it says here in verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters and the assembly. I will sing your praises. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Jesus is your brother. And so we are family. And, you know, you hate it when you have brothers and sisters and, and your parents are like, why can't you be more like your brother? Oh, yeah. But that's what God says. Yeah. He said, I want you to be like your brother, Jesus. He's our example. The rules, the rules of this household 
So Old Testament and the New Testament with Jesus, our older brother, being the example. So how do we enter this amazing family? Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 26. How do, we, how do we enter into this amazing family? Verse 26 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Mm -hmm. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So when do you become a member of this family? At baptism. You can write the other scriptures down. Romans 6, 3 through 4, you're baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13 says you are baptized into the body. And so at baptism is when you become a member of this family. And I love this, this version here, Galatians 3, 26, because he says there's no Jew or Gentile. So race makes no difference. There's no race greater than any other race in the kingdom. We're all equal. There's no male or female. And you know, well, there's male and female, but we're all heirs. That's not right. We're all equal. We're all equal. Right? Yeah. And so, uh, and that's important. You know, in, in this world that we live in, outside the kingdom, people are always trying to fight for their rights. Mm -hmm. You know, women are fighting for their rights. And it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Uh, different races trying to fight for their rights. It's, you want equality. It's never going to happen. It doesn't matter who you vote in, who you vote out. It's never going to happen. It's only in the kingdom of God. And so we got to make sure we understand that. We have a conviction of that. Amen. And when people come into the kingdom... That doesn't just go away. They still have these feelings. They still have all this stuff that they need to get through and understand that in the kingdom, this should not be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, here he says, uh, no male, or it says, nor is there male and female. Men have used and abused women since, <laughs> I don't know, chapter 2. <laughs> in the Bible. <laughs> and uh, and we have to understand that. When people, when women come in to the kingdom, they need time mm -hmm. to understand how valuable they are. Because in the world, they get beat on. You're not as good as us. You don't get to make as much as us, etc. And they think that love is physical touch. Why? Because that's the only time they feel love from men. And so they need time to really walk with God, walk with Jesus, understand how valuable they are, that they are equal heirs Amen. in the kingdom. Amen, bro. And, and we got to understand that and have a conviction of that and protect our sisters. Amen. Amen. Okay. That was the second one. One body. <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 4, it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Here we see that the Bible teaches there is one body. And you can write these down, Romans 12, 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13, it says that there is one body. And so why are there over 4,000 denominations in the U.S.? Why is there so much division? So this part I broke up into two sections. 
ungodly division and godly division. So let's look at ungodly division. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay. Verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Paulus. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? What's the answer? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Okay, very good. That's awesome. Um, and so here what's happening is they're starting to follow personalities. And now there's divisions and quarreling that goes on. And so the question is asked, how many bodies are there? Well, biblically, there's one. But you have the Lutheran Church. Who started the Lutheran Church? Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Okay, so here you have the Lutheran Church. Started... By, it wasn't actually Martin Luther. It started after he died, but they took his teachings and they added it to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so you can be baptized into this church, so you have a body there, but it's not the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's Luther's body. Uh, who started uh, Presbyterians? Anybody? ICCM? You are correct. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you can get baptized into the Presbyterian Church. There's several here in Syracuse. And so you are baptized into a body. But is it the one body that the Bible talks about? It's not, but it is a body. Um, and we can go on and on and on. John and Charles Wesley, Methodists, Alex... Xander Campbell, uh, Campbell, Church of Christ, Barton Stone. He started uh, the one where you pray Jesus in your heart. Uh, the Mormons, uh, John Smith. Uh, the Catholic Church, it's basically the infallibility of the Pope. And so he gets enlightened and can add or subtract to the Bible. Yeah. Similarly, the... Um, the uh, uh, Pentecostal church, they can get enlightened and whatever God is telling them, they can add to the scriptures. And so look over at Matthew chapter 15. I, uh, <clears throat> I don't teach the history of the church. Um, I think that's a good thing to do after baptism. I think these are the four key things right here that they understand. That there are other bodies. Even though the Bible says there's one, there's one biblical body, but there are other bodies that you can be baptized into. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 15, verse 6. Um, 6b. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. So here Jesus can talk about traditions being added to the worship. Verse 7, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And so when you take a, a man that adds to the scriptures, this is what Jesus says happens. You become a hypocrite. Your hearts are far from him. Your worship is in vain. You're just following human rules. And so we want to make sure that we are part of the body, the biblical body. Let's look at godly division. Luke chapter 12. And I'll, I'll draw these out when I share, when I do a study. I'll draw more bodies than just that one that we 
probably do. What chapter? Uh, 15, Matthew 15. Oh, no, no. No, Luke 12. Sorry, Luke 12. Thank you. Verse 51, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Jesus says he came to bring division. He understands that what he's teaching not everyone is going to agree with. Um, it goes against human nature to deny yourself, to pick up your cross daily. Uh, and so there will be division. Look at John chapter 10. In verse 19, it says, The Jews who had heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So his words cause division. And if we preach the same words as him, it'll cause division. Some people will accept it. Others will not. And you will get uh, people that will persecute you. And here you see some character assassination, calling him demon possessed and raving mad. And that'll happen. Um, just look us up online. Well, don't do that. It's, it's so bad. But that's basically what they do to our church. They annihilate us. Why? Because we're teaching the words of Jesus, and it makes people uncomfortable mm -hmm. uh, to do that. But if uh, the church you belong to is not being persecuted, then it's not the church of the Bible. Yeah. And so you got to just go, okay, uh, is what we're teaching trying to divide people or are we trying to unite people are we pulling people away from the truth or are we taking a stand for the truth and so when you take a stand for the truth you will divide it's not your desire but it will happen right. we are trying to gather people to jesus and so people will say are you saying dave that you're the only people that are saved Sounds like that's what you're saying. Well, now you take them to Acts chapter 11. Ooh. Acts chapter 11. This is in the discipleship study. Uh, let's start in verse 22. Acts 11, 22. It says, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So what was the news? It was that Jews and Greeks uh, were worshiping the Lord together, and that was like the first time it was a big deal. And so that news gets to Jerusalem, and they send a leader there to check it out. Verse 23, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. And if you look it up in the Greek, he says, remain true to the purpose you've been given. He's like, remain true to the purpose with all your heart. It says he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. A great number of people were brought to the Lord. So he's like, hey, keep doing what you're doing. Remain true to the purpose. And so they brought more people. And this is what disciples do. Then, uh, verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught a great number of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And so what is the church? It's disciples. It's disciples that remain true with all their hearts to their purpose to go and make disciples and save the whole world, to bring Jesus to the whole world. Mm -hmm. Not to make a nice little community church where you can feel good about yourself, but to be willing to go anywhere, do anything, give up everything for the sake of the gospel. And this is what you see is the church. And so uh, most scholars 
divide up the church into two ways. Uh, one is church universal, and so that's everyone who makes a decision as an adult to have faith in Jesus, to repent of their sins, to get baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Um, and God sees all those people from heaven. He can see everyone. Then there's the invisible church, where you walk in and you go from that wall to that wall, it's disciples, except for the people that they're bringing. <laughs> right? But it's just filled with disciples. Yeah. With the purpose of giving up everything to go anywhere, do anything, to spread the message all around the world. Yeah. Like if that is the visible church, uh, that's what we want to be. Mm -hmm. We want to be the visible church that in any city, any nation, any country, any town, you can find us. And uh, uh, right now we're in 170 nations. We got, what, 60 more to go or something like that? Mm -hmm. And we want to do that. But even after that, there's millions of towns we, we got to get into. And so we want to be the visible church. And if people are looking for a visible church where everyone sitting in the church is a disciple, then the conclusion will be that's us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so how many bo uh, bodies are there? One true, body. one true body. There you go. One true body, uh, biblical. But remember, you can be baptized into a body that is not biblical. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I put a question mark there. Okay. Uh, I also uh, don't teach the five core convictions. Is and then you know, once someone understands the truth, then they'll be able to see the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Okay. Final one, my role. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, my role in God's family. In verse 12, it says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, I love this part, it's funny. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Stop there for a second. This is awesome. Like, it would be weird if we were all just a bunch of noses stuck together. You know what I mean? Like, like there's a bunch of parts. But here's the key in verse 18. Fact. It says fact right here. God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. You know, maybe, uh, maybe Levi wanted a sister. <laughs> it's not up to him, right? No, no. no. Uh, you know, we can get attitudes in the church, our brothers and sisters. You are disrespecting God. It says here, he placed the parts of the body the way he wanted them to be. Yeah. Well, we don't choose who's going to be open, who's not going to be open. We're going to love everyone equally. We cannot have attitudes wow. with people, look down on oh, people. Wow. Uh, we've got to make sure we understand that. Amen. We need each other. God has put us Amen. together. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. 
And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. You cannot say, uh, I don't need you, or you don't need me. Like, you can't go, well, I'm doing good today spiritually, so I don't need to go to midweek. <laughs> no. You need to come and give someone a hug. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we can't say we don't need you. I don't, you don't need me. We've got to take care of each other. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is, uh, this is when you study with someone who's not married. Singles. Teens. Verse 14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God. And they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no one clean thing, and I will receive you, and I'll be, your fa I'll be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Wow. I love the verse 17. It says, come out from them. That's actually where we get the word church. It's defined as the assembly, but it's also defined as the called out. So we are the assembly of the called out in the church. He says, do not yoke yourself with unbelievers. And so uh, yoking is, uh, you know, when you get married, you become one, right? Yeah. And so before you get married in the United States, you date. Not in India. You just get married. <laughs> I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> Dating can be a hassle. So in the church, to be the called out, God is telling us that we only date disciples. Yeah. And uh, we only marry the disciples. Yeah. Uh, you do not want to be married to a non-disciple. You don't. You want to have the same purpose, same heart. Um, and so that's why this is in the scriptures, because God loves us, wants us to be happy. And so what is my role? Why are we talking about this? What's my role as a single or campus? Well, in the world, especially on social media, where they can uh, make the lighting perfect and post all the greatest things, we can get fooled into thinking that people are dating and they're just having this feel. And why can't I? And then you start feeling, I wish I could be on dates. And then all of a sudden, Satan uses a coworker and it's like, hey, let's go out, mm. right? Yep. And so we got to protect each other. Amen. We got to protect each other, uh, brothers. You need to be taking the sisters on dates. Yeah. 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 Come on. Yeah. It, it needs to happen. Uh, I was taught this um, when I studied the Bible. I was taught this. And um, I wasn't sure how all that worked. But I believed what the scripture said. I trusted that uh, what's happening is real. I trusted that what this is happening. What this is have, what's happening is real. Like these people love God, and I'm going to listen to them. And so I would go to 
the uh, women's ministry leader, and I'd say, so which sister has not been on a date? Because I was told there are sisters that never get asked on dates. Wow. And I go, okay, so who should I take on a date? And every week, I made sure I had my calendar. Um, and then I moved to Ventura, and I was still going out on dates with sisters in other churches, because I just wasn't thinking. And the guy that discipled me said, why don't you go out with sisters here? And I go, well, who, do you, who would you suggest? Yeah. And then he started talking to <laughs> he started talking to the sisters there, and they all were whispering to each other. <laughs> you should go out with Jill. You guys would be perfect. Awesome. I didn't know who she was. But they were right. It was awesome. And so, you guys need to go on dates every week. Yeah. If, you're not, if you're not going on dates every week, you're disrespectful to God. But I don't have the money. You don't need money. For a walk, you go to the park, throw a frisbee. <laughs> My favorite part was the next day, the brother sat me down and like, take this piece of paper, fold it, and then draw something on there, and then write a scripture inside, and, you know, it's like, okay, thank you, card. Thank you for the date. That was so much fun. And then you give it to the sister on Sunday. It was just great. It was had a good time being in the singles ministry. Yeah. And uh, I went out with 15, 20 different sisters, uh, just getting to know them until I, I met Chip. And I think, you know, that little arrow through the heart kind of thing, the smile. I mean, so you never know. You just, you just want to serve God. And then when it's right, when God chooses the one that you should be with, it'll happen. Okay, what else is a role out there for me? Malachi chapter 3. We're going to talk about money. You got to make sure that when you say the Bible to someone, you talk about the dating if they're single. Don't skip over it. You gotta talk about it yeah. and uh, talk about how much fun it is. Yeah. It's so much fun. Uh, the double dating, the purity, yeah. the no expectation, yeah. uh, no weirdness, none of that stuff. Uh, it's totally pure, totally of God, and it's fun. Yeah. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So here um, is a reminder not to rob God. And it starts off with, uh, I, the Lord, do not change. Because some people go, well, that's Old Testament. No, 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 the Lord does not change. And we are built on the foundation of, of the prophets and the apostles. This is a prophet right here. We are built on this foundation. Um, but you can go to 1 Corinthians 16. We'll look at a New Testament scripture. 1 Corinthians 16. Now, in Malachi, he talks about giving a tithe. That's 10% of your income. And some people don't understand what a tithe is, so you've got to make sure you explain it. Before taxes, if you make $1,000 in a week, What's a tithe? $100. $100. There it is. That's how easy it is. First to the Lord, then to the government. Um, you do not want your disciples that you baptize to be under a curse. I was talking to a Christian who leads the teens. And you know, the teens, they're not working. 
but it's still an opportunity to talk to them. Because I tell you what, if they want to go to the movies, they're going to get that money, yeah. <laughs> right? And so if they don't want to be under curse, they're going to get that dollar. And that dollar is not going to make a difference if we can meet in here or not. But it keeps them out from under a curse. Right. Yeah. And we've got to teach them not to be under a curse. Mm. Anyone who gets baptized, if you don't explain this to them, you are baptizing into a curse. Mm. Wow. And if you want to know what the curses are, read Deuteronomy 28. You do not want that for your people. Mm. You want them to be under the blessings of God. And so that's why Malachi says this. It helps us to have a conviction that God will bless us if we trust him in this area. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. It says, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, that's Sunday, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Saving it up. I love this part. So that when I come, no collections have to be made. So I don't have to go to your door. Boom, boom, boom. Where's your tithe? But that's what he says he would do. Like if you don't give your tithe, he's going to go and knock on your door. Why? Because he doesn't want them to be under a curse. He'd be willing to go knock on their door. We've got to have a conviction about this. I do believe in tithing. I think if everyone tithed, we would not have any problems in the church. Mm. We wouldn't. Um, side note, we started the year with 53 disciples. And um, we are now at 70. Hey. We're heading in the right direction. Uh, that's with Bob and Mary leaving, you know, people that have gone. Uh, but we're still growing. But we are giving a thousand dollars less per week. How is that possible? Well, I believe people are not tithing. And then what happens when you're in a curse? The Bible says he puts holes in your pocket. He puts holes in your pocket uh, so that you're just living paycheck to paycheck. This is you're under a curse. Give a tithe and watch the blessings. Amen. Bro. That's what, that's what Malachi says. Um, so we're going to have a pledge drive. Please pray about it. Uh, we are, uh, we've hired Christian. We've hired uh, Kyle to be on campus, to preach the word, to baptize. They've both been fruitful the last three or four weeks. And so you see how that works. Paul was a tent maker, yes, but as soon as the money came, he went full time and the church exploded. And so we want to hire more people. And so we've got to get that contribution back where it was. Uh, we want to send out a team to Albany, all those yeah. things. And so I'll hand out a card on Sunday. Think about what you want to give. It's between you and God. Please make it a tithe minimum. And, and let's turn those in, maybe not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. So we'll give you time to pray about it and what you want to give. And then Maya will take those numbers and we can figure out if we can afford who we have and if we can hire someone else as well. Because uh, that's the goal. Amen? Amen. All right, let's close out <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, back to the money part. It says tithes and offerings. You want to teach the offerings part as well. So the tithing takes care of the local church. The offerings takes care of those who are uh, missionaries. We do that twice a year. And on Wednesdays, we give a benevolence for those in the church that need help. Or like when Hawaii was on fire, we sent money out there to help them. Um, okay. Or today. We just did that today for someone not part of the church, but for Kawana. Amen. Hebrews 10, verse 19. This is amazing. I love doing this passage at the very end of all the first principles because it all comes together right here. Every one of the studies comes together right here. In verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of of Jesus, because that's what saves us. Yes. It's the blood of Jesus. Amen. 
by a new and living way. See, the most holy place in the Old Testament was a very scary place. Yeah. Um, they would tie a rope around the chosen priest. And if they went into the most holy place and made a mistake, they would die. And then the people outside would pull them out because wow. they weren't allowed to go in there. And so if they had unconfessed sin or were unrighteous or just did the wrong procedure, they would die. And here's like, we have confidence that we don't have to be afraid to go into the most holy place. Because of the blood of Jesus, he says, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is what? His body. It's the church. The church, when we get baptized, we go through the curtain into the most holy place. This is the most holy place right here. Is that awesome? Yeah. It says, since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. What is that? Baptism. Baptism. That baptism right here, boom, we go into the most holy place. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The final role is we need to spur one another on. Towards love and good deeds. Amen. A spur, think about it, is what a cowboy uses to kick the horse, right? And so in this analogy, we kick disciples. <laughs> we kick them. And we get them to do what? To love and good deeds. And so sometimes we need a good kick. And this is what the this is what the church is for. That we come together. And we go, hey, snap out of here. You don't have to be down. You can be joyful. Yeah. Amen. Let me give you a hug. What do you need? Uh, today, I called up George because uh, I'm not sure how to help, but I always go to food. You know, I was like, hey, can I go to McDonald's for you? He's like, yeah, he sent me an order. <laughs> it was great. I got to go and hang out with George and give him some food. Uh, but this is what we can do. I was really proud of Christian. You know, he uh, he sent all the teens out. Hey, teens, you, you can give tonight and, and help a family. Uh, last week, he's like, hey, we're going to go visit Sharon. Told all the teens, we're going to go visit Sharon and, and uh, all the sewers. He's a big brother. We need to be. We need more big brothers and sisters that spur one another on towards love and good deeds. The awesome word here in verse 24 is the word consider. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, he doesn't give us a checklist. He gives us the freedom to be creative. Mm -hmm. What can I do? What can I say? What can I give? What can I, how can I inspire? How can, what can, you know, what kind of creativity for this person? Because we're all so unique. Yeah. We all feel love differently. We're all inspired differently. Yeah. And we can sit down and consider what does this person need so they can be inspired to love and to do good deeds. And so he ends there with a little warning not to miss church. <laughs> so don't be in the habit. You should not have a reputation that you don't show up to things. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what he's saying. Why? Because the body needs you. You can't say, I don't need the body. And so Sundays, Wednesdays, Bible talk. We're starting Bible talks. Yep. Don't miss Bible talk. It's important. Uh, for the campus, we have campus devos. <laughs> campus devos are on Friday nights. You know why? Because it's the most wicked time of the week for the yes. campus. <laughs> They're out there partying Friday nights. They just studied hard all week, and Friday nights they get in trouble. So we provide a safe place for them. And a lot of them are looking for a safe place. Yeah. Uh, they go into campus with moral clauses that they made to themselves. But by the second year, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. They've done it all. And so we want to make sure that our brothers and sisters don't miss campus devos, and that we don't miss that we're there to encourage them. Mm -hmm. So four simple ways to remember this study. The body of Christ, the family of God, one body 
question mark, <laughs> and my role. If you can remember those four, you'll be able to do this study no problem. 